And this is Ken Tapping. Oh, get CIO. you too. <laughs> and uh, he'll be telling us all about the Magnetrons, his art, Covington, and the genesis of Canadian Radio Astronomy. I think it was interesting, as uh, Woody said when he started his presentation, that the momentous discoveries made by Jansky and Reber essentially went no place before the Second World War. And during the Second World War, of course, the explosion of new technologies, plus the, uh, the fact that the scientists from universities and industry were all being jammed together uh, to work on military systems, I think increased the level of, of understanding between scientists, which uh, created the, uh, the circumstances under which radio astronomy could get going at the end of the Second World War. And of course, the other part was all this technology that was developed and sitting around. Uh, actually, a lot of that stuff was still for sale in government surplus stores in London when I was starting doing backyard radio astronomy. So I've still got some electronic components at home that are way older than I am. Now, when I was putting this talk together, I put, a, I put a timeline in that was for my use only. And then I thought, to heck with it, what I'll do is I'll leave the timeline in, run, under, run over it very quickly, and then it would be possible to um, um, understand the flow of stuff without my trying to remember dates as we go through. I can remember one date, 1066. Other than that, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, since I've been in Canada, 1867. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, a lot of this brings around a vacuum tube called the magnetron. And I thought I'd start off by clearing a bit of misunderstandings about that. Uh, the Brits did not invent, sorry, we did not invent the resonant cavity magnetron in 1940. Uh, it was actually invented in the 1920s and then improved steadily, although what, in 1940, Randall and Boot at Birmingham University improved it to a point where you could now generate large amounts of power at centimetre wavelengths. And in 1940 also, centimetre wavelength radar was seen as a critical war requirement, but Britain was in no position to develop them into viable radar systems. So in 1940, um, Tizard and a bunch of other British scientists uh, brought to North America and elsewhere in the Commonwealth um, all the military secrets that would have been militarily useful that Britain wasn't in a position to develop, including the resonant cavity magnetron. Now, timeline two. So Tizard arrives, brings magnetrons to Canada and the USA. 1940, the National Research Council sets up a radio development, radar development group. And in 1942, Arthur Covington joined this radar group uh, what they were doing were improving magnetrons, producing more of them, developing radar systems in which to incorporate those devices. And then in, 1940 to, in 1945, Covington proposed to NRC that we, we would have fun building a small radio telescope, and that's what started radio astronomy in Canada. Between 19 and 1940 and 1945, there were assorted discoveries made sort of by accident, um, in the process of the war, and Woody alluded to them this morning, earlier. And in 1946, uh, Canada's first radio telescope was complete and deployed just south of Ottawa. In 1948, they were driven away from the site because of interference to a farm site, also near Ottawa, and built um, in instruments that improved waveguide, improved resolution. In 1949, uh, 1959, the interference at Goth Hill, mainly from uh, Ottawa Airport, became intolerable, and they needed to, relocate, ro really to, needed to relocate. And in 1957, uh, there were decisions made to build radio observatories at Penticton at Lake Traverse, Algonquin Park, and the, in 1960, the flux monitor from uh, Ottawa was relocated to ARO. And just soon after, another radio telescope, solar radio telescope, was implemented here. And in 1971, the Goth Hill site was originally closed down. And that ends the sort of phase one of the development of radio astronomy in Canada. From this point, others then will continue the history. So in 1940, Sir Henry Tizard um, brought Britain's military secrets to North America and elsewhere in the Commonwealth. 
One of these actually was the idea for supersonic aircraft of adjusting the whole tailplane rather than just the elevators, and they were used in the Bell X-1, and uh, Jaeger broke the sound barrier with it. But the main element was the resonant cavity magnetron, and Tizard's on the left, and Taffy Bowen was another one of the visitors, and there's the magnetron in a reenactment 40 years later, and that magnetron was the one that was brought to Canada is currently at the National Museum of Science and Technology, and it was borrowed by the Brits for that, and then returned to Canada afterwards. So something about the magnetron. Now the mag magnetron was a vacuum tube that uses a mag magnetic field as well as voltages, and it can, it, it essentially is an oscillator that, ex, that uh, generates <coughs> oscillations uh, in the space charge between the cathode and the anode, and this space charge rotates and excites radio waves in the cavities, and then you can pull out the radio waves through a probe and take them off to an antenna. And this here is the prototype made by um, Randall and Boot at Birmingham University. Uh, there's the anode block of a magnetron. You can imagine someone blowing across the top of a lot of milk bottles. You know, when you blow across a big milk bottle, you get a low, you know, those big plastic bottles you get in BC. You can blow into them and across the top and you get a low frequency oscillation. Well, there you have the space charge blowing across the tops of all those and you excite oscillations in the cavity. And you can generate, with the Randall and Boot version of the magnetron, you can generate um, tens of kilowatts, hundreds of kilowatts, or even megawatts of pulse power. Before this, people couldn't generate centimetric radio waves at high powers. There's a picture of a magnetron there. There's the version that came to Canada. And for the rest of this talk, I got my information um, from the National Museum of Science and Technology from GEC at Wembley in Britain that did the manufacturing of um, magnetrons, uh, a bit of correspondence with Birmingham University, but most of all, when I joined NRC, I was over the corridor from Arthur Covington. So we had lots of conversations. And the frequency of the magnetrons was largely dictated by what was available at the time. Um, a bunch of magnetrons were made for bringing to North America, and the wavelength of oscillation was partly generated by what was available. Now, I got this from Birmingham University and a couple of sources, but a lot of years have passed, and uh, uh, I haven't got too much of a prominence, but it makes sense. The machinist at Birmingham was told to turn out some magnetrons. The copper stock was not very... Uh, available, and the available copper tube, copper rod, and the fact that the only tool for extracting the cores from this was a bicycle hub puller uh, meant that the magnetrons would go at a wavelength of about 10 centimeters. Now, why was the magnetron important? This is what radar systems were like in the early years of the war. The problem was a radar uses a high power transmitter, particularly when the targets are not that interested in being detected. And so you need large transmitter powers. Unfortunately, large transmitter powers were totally unachievable at anything other than meter wavelengths. Which meant, for example, if you're trying to put the antennas for a radar system on a night fighter, the antennas become a major part of the aircraft. Um, and you can see where those wavelengths with that size of an array, your resolution is not going to be that great anyway. Uh, now, that's a German aircraft, because I couldn't find a picture of a British aircraft that looks exactly the same, festooned with antennas. And so night fighters were not very effective. You often couldn't find your target. Uh, also, um, at these long wavelengths, you couldn't pick up the periscope of a submarine. And these, these radars, when you go out on the battlefield and you wreck these, you're sort of obvious. <laughs> and so the magnetron changed it to this. <laughs> 
just by virtue of being able to generate large amounts of power at very short wavelengths. So here, a small dish built into the nose of an American fighter. So you can see here the dish will pivot. You've got directivity. The thing's probably got a beam width of a few degrees at 10 centimeters. Here's one sitting on the ground. And you can see radar had changed. You can also see lots of bits here you can make a radio telescope out of. So, and then during the conduct of the war itself, with the heavy use of electronics, people, things were discovered. Radars looking for V2 rockets, early ballistic missiles, also detected ionization trails produced by meteors and launched a new branch of meteor science. In 1942 and later, uh, centimeter wavelength receiving systems were used to pick up radio emission from the sun. Now, at that time, people thought the emission was just a thermal black body radiation at centimeter wavelengths, but people detected it. Centimetric radars increased increases in noise level when scanning across the rising or setting sun. You know, you're in a ship in the middle of the Pacific, the radar is scanning around, and when the sun is rising and setting, you get a big spike in noise when the dish crosses, when the antenna scans across the sun. So you're getting thermal noise from the sun. And also, in 1942, uh, J.S. Hay um, noted, uh, well, the anti-aircraft radars all over Britain were jammed by large bursts of noise that were coming from the sun. So during the war, we got very good cross-fertilization building up between scientists due to the war effort in every country involved pretty well. After the war, there were piles of military equipment sitting around waiting to be used for something else. There's a sun strobe. That's a radar image from the United States. And so you can see, I put the sun in there, uh, but you can see a big increase in noise level when you're scanning across the sun, indicating the sun's emitting radio waves. In 1942, anti-aircraft radars like this one were jammed by meter wavelength emission from the sun. So again, now we know that the sun emits very strong bursts of radio emission as well. So we're building up to lots of things we can research with all this interesting hardware once we're not fighting each other anymore. So the magnetrons in Canada were taken to NRC in Ottawa. And um, afterwards, um, Covington got permission to build a radio telescope here, which is just south of Ottawa at the radio NRC field station. So this is where Canada's first radio telescope was put together. And what he did, he took a four-foot dish off one of those, and he had been researching the performance of mixer crystals. Now, one of my books on uh, radar uh, said, and it was written about 1957 or something like that, it said, RF amplification is impractical above three gigs. Fortunately, that's not true anymore. But what it meant was your receiver started with a mixer. And so the quality of your mixer, the, the efficiency of the mixer, plus the noise temperature of the next stage dictated how well your system was going to work. So there was a lot of research on mixers. And so Covington and his colleagues had put together uh, a test rig for testing the quality of mixers. And basically, it was a Dickey radio receiver. So he was comparing this good old 1N21 silicon diodes with one another. How do you drive them? What's the best circuit to put them in? How much LO power do they need? And, the, and this um, switch here, this is the receiver that he built out of this uh, mixer testing equipment, uh, were two rotating disks, one with aluminum foil on, one with carbon resistance. And when they were crossing the waveguide, the aluminum foil was exactly lambda over four from the absorber, which put a voltage maximum in the absorber, which made it a load. This thing operated at 10.7 centimeters. So the radio receiver operated at 10.7 centimeters, which is interesting when it starts, it dates back to a bicycle hub puller and a piece of copper rod. 
So this is Canada's first radio telescope. Four foot dish, dipole feed, coax going through to the back, and there you can turn the handle and move the thing. And it was eventually motorized to drive in our angle, um, but you would adjust the declination by hand. And waveguide, a couple of rotating joints, and then a nice big thick waveguide going off to the receiver. So that was Canada's first radio telescope. And that was the one that was used to point around the sky. Now, at the time, of course, people knew very little about what was going on in the sky. Uh, we didn't know much about the spectrum, didn't know anything about the spectrum of cosmic radio emission or the spectrum of solar emission, for that matter. And so, as Covington described it, as Woody described it, they pointed that antenna at everything in the sky they could think of. They pointed it at the sun and got a significant increase. They pointed it at Jupiter and got nothing. Pointed at the Milky Way and got nothing. Uh, they might have got a degree Kelvin or two, I suppose, if they pointed at the galactic center, but they wouldn't have seen it with that receiver. Um, Aurora Borealis, they got nothing. They went, away and rep they went away and updated the receiver and went back and tried it all again. And this is around 1946. And I think this is where Covington did something that changed everything. He calibrated it. And he found the solar emission between the various occasions when he'd been looking at the sun with this equipment, the flux density from the sun had changed. And that triggered the idea of what's going on here. Is it something to do with sunspots or something? And there is a calibration being done by Arthur Covington on the four-foot dish. The calibration device is a box filled up with absorber and an absorption sheet there. So when you put this over the dipole, you're seeing some sort of load at ambient temperature. Once again, this thing is not a big block absorber. What it is is a thin layer absorber with a metal plate a quarter wavelength behind it. Very nice. I suppose absorber was hard to get then and this was a way of getting a load with what's available. Anyway, it worked as an effective black body calibrator, and that enabled him to calibrate the antenna temperature of the dish fairly accurately. Is that Covington? That's Covington. Back in 1965. <laughs> and this, um, this is a photograph of a piece of chart, obviously. A solar eclipse, 23 November 1946. And this shows a partial eclipse of the sun that took place in the Ottawa area then. The original record, Covington's later notes on the thing. And uh, on the original chart, you can see all the pencil comments all over here. Um, now, there, in one of the talks this morning, the second talk, there was this morning the importance of hanging on to heritage material. When the NRC in Ottawa was ceasing its astronomy operations on Sussex Drive, a lot of stuff found its way into the corridor in, in piles. Uh, we were unable to bring all the stuff from the solar storage room with us. And, but I was rooting through this stuff and found a piece of chart, and it was this. So I've got that in my filing cabinet at the moment, waiting until we have a proper home for it. But anyway, here is a photograph of it. And it shows the solar radio emission decreasing as the, the moon goes across in front. It also is a good indication of how much receivers have improved since then. But the result of this was um, the conclusion that a significant contribution of the emission from the sun was coming from a group of sunspots. The beginning of the identification of what we now know as the slowly varying component of solar activity. So eventually, interference became just too bad at the field station, partly because of the other radio experiments going on at the field station, because it was a general radio experimentation site. And so they moved to part of a farmer's field. The farmer's name was Goth. So the corner of the field where they set everything up was Goth Hill Observatory. Over here, there's the four-foot dish. There's a 10-foot dish that's not quite running yet here. 
And there is a horn here uh, used for making absolute flux measurements over a range of wavelengths to try to establish what the spectrum of solar radio emission is. So this is the multi-frequency horn. And I think this is a fascinating thing. I think everyone should have one of these in their backyard. I mean, I, you'd have the RCMP around so fast. <laughs> but this was part of a tremendous effort in producing absolute calibrations. There's Norm Broughton as a young man standing in front of the 10-foot dish that was now then in action. And the waveguide run to the receiver package in the back. One of, I think one of the great developments in Canadian radio astronomy is you don't have to wear ties anymore. <laughs> so this was a calibration standard that was used to tie the 10.7 centimeter flux calibration to the ground and was used for a long time in the early days of what became known as F10.7. So there are the, there's this double horn calibration antenna set up at Goth Hill. In those days, there was no receiver package or anything down here. The horns went back here, ended. You went to coaxial cable and came out of a rotating joint to a tie pin socket at the end of the axes. Um, <clears throat> when I inherited the program in the 1980s, um, I figured we really wanted that calibration horn out of the NRC scrapyard, which is where it was. So we pulled it out and repaired it and used it to fix the calibration. So, even if our data's wrong, at least it's consistent. So this is the horn antenna as it's now sitting here at DREO with the receiver packages all built into the back and uh, fabric over the apertures to stop um, birds and wasps getting in. And of course, two flux points. When ARO and DREO appeared on the scene, um, this was the flux monitor built here to provide an extra three hours of coverage. That antenna uh, was at Algonquin Radio Observatory. That antenna is now sitting on the concrete plinth to the south of the solar hut, and a new one was built which is sitting on the tower. And this interferometer was set up at Algonquin Park um, to scan the east-west distribution of active centers on the sun. And, OK, this is just a modern picture. Uh, I, this is beyond the end of my talk, really. This is Goth Hill in 2013. And we went and finally found the place and had a look. And I don't know what the 999 was for, but I couldn't <laughs> resist taking a picture of it. Anyway, done. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I noticed uh, in the figure, your figure two, I think, the, the first Canadian radio telescope, that there was a waveguide running away from the telescope. Yes. And I wondered why the mixer wasn't mounted close to the feed, so it wouldn't have to bring the original signal down. To the yeah, I, I know that was interesting. But actually, if you go out and look at what we're doing now, we're doing the same thing. Um, the receivers have upgraded a lot, but we're still coming through a whole pile of waveguide. Um, the waveguide loss is actually quite small for something like this. And I think one of the things for, and I think probably apply to Covington's day even more than now, but even now we're obsessive about it, that really um, when you're looking at the quiet sun, you've got an antenna temperature about 300 Kelvin. Uh, the major problem is not so much brute sensitivity, it's stability. And so if you're looking at the sun all day and... I mean, receivers improved immensely, but in the design of the solar receivers we have now, in the, with the obsession on stability, all the receiver components are built or in a big, thick aluminum slab. And then we come in with waveguides. So all the receiver components are all together in one thing with a huge thermal time constant. I think probably this was even more the case with Covington et al., um, that they weren't too worried about the waveguide loss.
Although, you know, one other thing, I mean, the, the, uh, the other component that goes with this, of course, is rotating joints. You're going through rotating joints as well. Uh, we try to monitor the operation of those rotating joints, but certainly we're looking at a generation of uh, radio telescope for solar flux monitoring that's going to do away with all this. We have one flux monitor, the one we're still working on calibrating and getting our software complete, uh, which is sitting over by the blockhouse for the synthesis telescope. It's a 12-foot dish, and there um, you go from feed right into the receiver straight away. About the Tissard mission, I, I got the impression from what I read, but I'm not an expert on it, that another motivation was that England might well be invaded yeah. and taken over. So it wasn't just a matter that they didn't have the time to work on it. In fact, they did a lot of microwave stuff uh, in England, but it was for fear that uh, well, this no. just would not get out. they got to get out while the getting's good. Well, you're, well, you're, well, I mean, you're right. I mean, this is the reason we, um, we um, the Tizard Commission brought the Magnetron to North America, to the U.S., yeah. and the U.S. wasn't even in the war yet. But it was perceived that the U.S. in the end would be the final bastion of democracy if everything else goes pear-shaped. Yes? Billy, just to follow up on that, there's lots of correspondence between the TRE and the radiophysics laboratory in Sydney because they, set, they were saying at least radiophysics would become the repository of uh, radar research in, mm -hmm. in Asia yeah. at the time of the perceived invasion. Oh, yeah. I mean, everyone was expecting it, minute by minute, really. I mean, not there was much there to stop it, actually. I think Covington was very lucky. The 10.7 centimeters turned out to be the, the ideal frequency to look at slowly varying components. Mm -hmm. And secondly, 10.7 centimeters, the, the antenna temperature comes out around 300 Kelvin, which is very easy to calibrate with an no, you're right. Um, I think the 10.7 the centimetre coincidence, I think, is one of the most amazing coincidences ever uh, when you start off with about 10 centimetres being conveniently centimetric, but you can make the magnetrons out of that available piece of copper rod and pull the plugs out with that bicycle hub puller. <laughs> And you wind up in the same area, and you're, and you're right. If you look at the variable component of the, if you look at the slowly varying component of solar radio emission, the peak is around 10 centimeters. And it was, and I, I didn't really um, broaden on the other thing you said, and that was, yes, 300 Kelvin. If you're doing absolute calibrations, an antenna temperature of 300 Kelvin is sort of nice. And then from there on, of course, it only goes up. I was wondering what the, uh, when they first uh, made magnetrons, whether they went up, what was, what was the limit of technology that they could be on bicycle? Uh, Canada, once, once Canada was in the equation and, you know, manufacturing was a bit beyond hub pullers, um, they actually made some radars at three centimeters. And actually, touching back on what Tom said, at the very beginning, Arthur Covington was torn between making a radio telescope at 10.7 centimetres and making a one at three centimetres. He made the right choice. The physical size of the waveguides and, just the, and everything was just right, it seemed. Yeah, you could, push the magnetron, the, you could push the magnetron design to get appreciable powers at three centimetres. I think they were getting pulses. They were driving a magnetron at three centimetres with 12 kilovolt pulses with 12 amps and producing one microsecond pulses at 44 kilowatts. At three centimeters. Just on, on the subject of X-band radar at three centimeters, um, that's the that makes a, a periscope of a submarine resonant, a resonant target <laughs> to radar. So that was that was a really mm -hmm. important reason to have X-band radar. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just a, you know, again, you should mention the big charge enterprises and weak side was actually set up to uh, make these things. What, what over here? In, in a, Mm -hmm. And it was disbanded after the war. No, actually, I didn't know that. I was following the radio astronomy rather than the magnetron at that point. But yeah, that was, well, these had, I mean, you're right, Joe. I mean, these things had to be made by the thousand. Yeah. Um, really mass produced. Go and do your research on research enterprises and these sites. Because NRC set that up to produce 
uh, radar, which they did, uh, the Mark III uh, uh, gun, gun laying radar. And they needed Magnetron to go with it. Mm -hmm. So they, they uh, only ran that until the end of the war, and then they disbanded it. They didn't want to compete with private industry. Okay. Well, one other thing, actually, seeing as we're getting into funny details, of course, is the story of the seven holer. Um, if you look at the early pictures of the magnetrons there, they had six resonant chambers, six resonant cavities in the anode block. Um, just before they were brought to North America, uh, one, of the one of the engineers said, well, make, make, uh, let's make an eight holder as well. These things need an even number of cavities to oscillate. And the machinists made the eight, and he thought, well, I've got some sixes, eight, so I'm going to make a seven. <laughs> and so this magnetron, which never worked, is out there somewhere. <laughs> yes. By the end of the war, around 45, these 10 centimeter radar sets were being dropped by parachute in the jungles of Burma. Mm -hmm. And after it was over, it was being first thrown into the Bay of Bengal. Yeah. And then the Prime Minister Nehru stopped that destruction and then supplied those radar sets, the 10 centimeter ones, to various educational institutions in India. <coughs> we got about 25 or 30 of them, the CR 584, for $50 each. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Arthur, after Arthur Covington died, I was contacted by his son. His son said, I've got a, he, he, my dad left an assortment of magnetrons. Do you want them? And for reasons I won't go on here, but if you're interested over coffee, I've got a sort of an interest in magnetrons. So I said, sure, and got a couple of typical magnetrons. And one of them was one of the Canadian copies of that original. Um, but the original is in the National Museum of Science and Tech in Ottawa, where I've actually been to see it. So, I can hang on to my copy. I think it's copy number 164 or something like that. But I thought they left six or seven in Canada. Um, the Canada started manufacturing them. No, but Sidgwick came over. Oh, yeah, he brought a set. He brought a set of them. And one of them was the seven holder. That's not one back then. I lose it. Ken, do you recall what else was being thrown out in that corridor? Was any of it saved? Did it save them? There were. Yeah, some of it's in my garden shed. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was in my garage, Joe. <laughs> um, the answer, the answer, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff went. There were some assaulted bits of equipment, uh, planimeters, uh, used to measure the area below <laughs> the um, solar images as a way of calibrating those one-dimensional scans. So I got a couple of thermometers, an adjustable scale, a couple of 20-inch slide rules, and assorted reports. There were some uh, collections of early papers that Covington had bound into books, and I snaffled those, and I've still got those. So I've got an assortment of material, but as far as I was concerned, the jewel in the crown was that crumpled up chart, 23 November 1946. But Arthur Covington was yeah. He took every, he made copies of everything, and I think all of those are in Kingston. Yeah. I yeah. don't think a lot, a lot got lost. No, I think you're right. But, but what I have is all Dick Finney's negatives from the, the uh, Photoshop, or the uh, photo division. Well, you've got something really useful there. Well, I, I got a lot of pictures, and I'm sure there's some of his charts and stuff in there. Mm -hmm. He used to publish this every month, so. Okay. Perfect. Any more questions? All right. Well, let's thank Ken again.